Because it adds up over time, you know? Like, you'll go through different stages of filming like that, and like, oh, like, now I like the wide shot. Like, you get up close to the fish, so it looks big. And each time you learn those different techniques, you learn where they kind of fit in each story you're trying to tell. Because it's not gonna be a film of just wide shots or a film of just nifty 50 f1.8 shots each shot has its place in a film so if you put all those little pieces together and have all these little tools in your toolkit these little skills from filming you know you put them together and to a film and you're able to create something with intention like and use that shallow depth of field to tell that part of the story that you want Welcome back, everybody, to uh, another Wildfly podcast. We've got a special guest today, my boy Will Phelps over here. We're in Montana right now. We're in Kalispell. My, a couple of my buddies and I came out here for a ski trip, and uh, Will lives out here. And so I was like, yo, Will, come, uh, come ski with us a little bit. And, uh, and then we're like, dude, let's, re- let's record a podcast while I'm out here. Talk about some video stuff, talk about some fly fishing, and uh, just kind of the whole deal. Basically, what we're going to be going over today is... Will is a videographer in the fly fishing industry. He's been doing videography, photography for a couple of years. And so we thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to kind of talk about kind of what that looks like in this industry and maybe just some, some, uh, some tools that we've learned over, over the years that uh, then hopefully can help some of you guys. I will, I will preface this by saying we are not pros by any means. We're, we're, we're trying to teach you guys from our experience and from what we've learned. By no means do we claim to know everything. But we're just going to have a fun chat and just nerd out in camera gear. <laughs> also, I forgot to mention that before recording this episode, I took to Instagram and had you guys submit some questions you had on filmmaking, YouTube, business, etc. So later in the episode, we have a Q&A segment where Will and I go through a bunch of those questions into more detail. And yeah, it was just really fun getting to hear Will's perspective on a lot of the questions. So if you're interested in hearing more about the Q&A, make sure you stick around for later in the episode. So let's get back to it. Playing with cameras is fun. We have three cameras right in front of us we had a great time setting up this little deal right here so glad to be here glad to spread some knowledge to you guys again yeah i don't consider myself a pro not on that level yet i learned from pros and i respect the pros we're still just you know on this long journey of camera operating and at this stage you know we're we're just trying to enjoy it and share some knowledge with you guys. Yeah, we've we've got three cameras set up. Typically, what you guys have seen on this podcast, it's just basically been my one Sony cam on a tripod, and then we've got like a GoPro and stuff elsewhere. But we've got three here, and we're, it's looking good, dude. Mm-hmm. This is so cool because I'm so used to just filming it by myself, but then having someone else, you're like, oh, dude, what do you think? Does this camera, does this angle look good? Does this look good? And then here we go. Yeah, <laughs> dude. We got the a7 III. We got the GH5 and the R5. Yes. So, full line for all of you who are curious what, what we're filming on there you go <laughs> yeah. well dude i'd love to start out just kind of give me a little background information on you know basically your job and what you do for those people who maybe maybe haven't heard of you or maybe don't know quite what you do for your job yeah man um well i kind of started out originally just guiding fly fishing you know i made a youtube channel and start, kind of started my career through just making YouTube videos and that eventually turned into, um, you know, working on a little bit bigger projects and doing a little bit of commercial work here and there, um, working for a few different companies in the fly fishing world, some lodges, um, outfitters, and also, um, some companies you might be familiar with, uh, yellow dog fly fishing adventures, Belize permit club, Las Pampas lodge down in Argentina. So not too bad. (laughs) It's a pretty cool gig. Yeah, it's a little scattered throughout the world. You know, a lot of traveling, um, not too much time at home. But these days, it's been great doing a lot more local work and, you know, shooting more of my own stuff, which is kind of fun, you know, just for YouTube. And when I first came to Montana, I, I was just looking for a guy job. I fished hard all through college, like spent a lot of time just on the river fishing and made a bunch of little GoPro videos here and there and just loved, you know, just being on the water and playing around with gear, you know, classic things. But, um, yeah, I kind of just made my way out to Montana just to explore the different fishing options. Cause growing up in the Southeast, you know, we have a lot of awesome fly fishing, 
but um, the amount of public land in the West really just drew me this direction. And coming out and visiting uh, for a lot of my life, my great aunt has a cattle ranch in Livingston, Montana. So I fished the Yellowstone growing up, fished in Yellowstone National Park. And it's really just the dry fly fishing that is the was the nail in the coffin for yeah. me, you know, like coming out here and throwing the big bugs and getting big cutties and rainbows and browns, you know, it, it doesn't get much better than that. So yeah, I packed up the truck and spent a couple summers just guiding and living in my truck and fish bumming it. And then, um, just started filming fly fishing videos on my own. And, um, yeah, I ended up getting in touch with a guy who lives in Bozeman. His name is Brian Gregson. And, um, he is the photographer at Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures. So my other friend who works there actually, um, got me in touch with him, Carter Lyle, is a good buddy of mine. And, um, he needed an assistant to come in and help him sort through some of his old footage and kind of do, you know, just, just some busy work, you know, help around. And then about a month after getting into Bozeman and living, living the life and, and, uh, just working with Brian in his basement, he invited me to go on a trip to Argentina for our first shoot together. And this is going, going from operating a GH2 and a GoPro to like traveling to Argentina with a camera to film stuff. Oh my God. So it was basically being thrown right into the fire there. And it was, it, it's not just like, let's go over to the Madison and choose something. It's like, no, we're going to Argentina. Yeah. <laughs> Argentina in January, you know, had very little experience even working in the field with Brian or doing any work with him at all. So he was putting a lot of faith in me and, I'd actually heard before that he'd had some assistants go down to Argentina with him and get sent home. <laughs> so that was looming over my head when we hopped on the plane for a three month trip. Oh my gosh, just three months? <laughs> three months down in Argentina, driving from lodge to lodge, just you know, shooting photos, gathering content for Yellow Dog, um, for some various individual lodges, and um, basically just carrying gear and making sure I don't break anything. <laughs> So what does it look like for you guys on one of those trips? Like, what is your objective for, for the company? Like, what are you guys hired to do? Yeah, like that? that kind of varies, you know. It, it really depends on, you know, where we're going, um, what the client needs. And most of the time, they need photo and video. They want everything. So that's why we work together as a team because Brian, he specializes in photography. Like, he is... He's a master of light. He knows what he's doing with a stills camera. He knows what he's doing with the video camera as well, but we can only operate one camera each. Say there's a jumping tarpon and you want stills and you want video of it. How's mm -hmm. one guy going to do that? You have to have two guys there to get that shot. So we work side by side in the field, gathering photo and video content um, for different lodges. Sometimes we'll end up with like a sizzle reel, a few little how-to videos, maybe some stuff um, to help Ang uh, traveling anglers know what to pack for a trip to that specific lodge you know various things like that and we'll come home and sort through all of it and edit it and see what we can get and provide to you know help um, bring business to different places around the world f for fly fishing so yeah and sometimes we'll also bring along products and shoot for companies like yeti um, hatch reels you know any sort of products that they need shot in the field, say we're going to Belize and we're bringing a go box with maybe some hatch nippers and shooting all those products while we're out there fishing, you know, tying on a fly, clipping the fly or casting, getting shots of the reel, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, yeah, and you get to go to some pretty sick locations, yeah. which is sweet. But so before we like too, too far into, into all that, when, because obviously, you know, you started working with Brian, but it wasn't like you were just some random dude, like on the side of the street. Like, when did you start picking up a camera and start filming? And then how, you know, how, like what, what level of filming do you think you were kind of at when you uh, got to first work with Brian? So I, I, I was really at a beginner level. I didn't even know how to use manual settings on the <laughs> camera. Like I was at the stage where you just point the camera at something, you hit the record button and you film it. And you know, what he told me is that it's more about like the drive to do filming versus the actual footage that you're getting. Cause it, it, even if you're a beginner and your footage isn't great, you know, if you're, if you have that creative energy and you're able to channel it into what you're doing and continue that process, it's, it's really just a matter of time before you're creating something really cool. 
mm-hmm. you know, because with each video I put out, I try and make it a little bit better here and there. And if, and it's not that hard to do, you know, it's just like with fishing, you go out and you learn something on the water every time you go fish and eventually you're able to catch a fish. You, you will eventually get one, yep. you know, I swear I will. <laughs> you will. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's the stage I was at and you know, it wasn't long before I was able to use manual settings and know what aperture and ISO and shutter speed are and the relationship between those, because really what, what makes you use those settings is your end goal. You know, what are you trying to achieve with those settings of your camera? You know, what, what's the shot you're really going for? So if you have an idea, um, is it's really just a matter of being able to capture that idea on camera, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So we get questions all the time that are, yo, what camera are you using? Like what I'm a beginner. Like, what should I start on? Like, how should I get into this? And I think we've always talked about the most, one of the most important things is understanding those manual settings on your camera and understanding like what ISO means, like what does aperture mean? What is shutter? And then understanding how those apply to, um, certain shots. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you're shooting a landscape shot, so you don't need it to be, you don't need your aperture to be at 1.8. You can open it up to, you know, F11, F12 or something like that. So like understanding the settings is is super important because no matter what camera you have, you you can use it to the best of its ability. You know, I think that's something that like we both started off on decent cameras and like not amazing cameras. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a process. It is a process, you know, as long as you understand the relationship between those three things, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, knowing those manual settings. You know, if you're a beginner and you want to start out shooting, just get a camera that has manual settings, you know, like you can learn all those things on any camera. It doesn't have to be the best camera in the world. As long as you're able to operate those functions and go out there and figure out, you know, what kind of look you can get with each setting, you'll be able to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What, what cameras did you, did you start off using when you were, were getting into it? Well, of course the GoPro. Of course, the, the good old GoPro. It's always in the kit. It goes it pretty it's much still goes, in the kit. Yeah, it goes everywhere. The, those things are never going to phase out. I don't know why, but they just keep coming out with new ones and they keep getting better and better. So, you know, the GoPro is always in there. And my first filming camera ever was the GH2. And that was a predecessor to the GH5, which I still shoot a lot on. Um, but yeah, very simple micro four thirds. It only shot 1080, 60 frames a second. That's pretty which, good. Yeah. For most of those DSLR, like entry level DSLR cameras, you know, they don't shoot 60 at 1080. So exactly. <laughs> and that's one thing that I really like noticed about that camera when I first shot it, I didn't know much about cameras at the time, but that slow motion and being able to get creative with it. Um, I mean, it just opened so many doors for shots. Cause like, Say you're filming a fish eating dry flies, you know, and that only happens once or twice every five minutes. The fish will come up and eat. You can film in slow motion and then you extend the amount of time you see that fish eat the fly. So you get more of a visual aspect of that shot from being in slow motion. You know, it's not just a quick cut of 24 frames a second. That's also goes into your not just understanding your manual settings, but understanding frame rate. So I guess to break it down for people who don't know, like typically, at least for me, I shoot like I'll export in like 24 frames or like, was it like 23.95? Yes. Like that's my 23.976. 976. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So a lot of, a lot of the 24 frames shots, if you're just shooting in 24 frames a second, you're not going to slow down. Your, those are going to be, you know, your shots, you know, these are just going to be played back in real time. Shutter speed, double your frame rate always. Yep. Yeah. If you're shooting in 24 frames a second, you want your shutter speed at one over 50. And so an ND, like what we use NDs for is so you can, you know, when you're shooting outside for fishing, especially is like you can control that shutter and keep it as low as possible or as low to that one over 50. To get that quote unquote cinematic look. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's, Hollywood. dude, it's, that was such a little trick that I figured out after a while And I was like, wow, it makes a huge difference. It doesn't matter what camera you're shooting on, like getting the right shutter speed for your 24 frames a second looks so good. Yeah. And you'll have to like look up a video if you guys are um, kind of curious what we're we're talking about to kind of have it make more sense. Exactly. And yeah, with 24 frames, it's if you're ever filming audio, you know, always film in 24 just because that's how you match the 
speaking to the actual what's happening on screen, you know? Yeah. So that's something to always keep in mind. Mm. So, yeah, something we wanted to talk about uh, during this was just like the the dynamic of filming fly fishing because we both have filmed other things, but it's definitely a much different approach and different dynamic from just traditional like filming. And so, dude, I'd love to hear from you, like what's been, what's like the biggest difference, so to say that you've, you found from like having to film fly fishing opposed to maybe some of your other work. Yeah. With fishing, you know, you can't always cue the fish, you know, other sports like skiing, snowboarding, um, the rider knows when to go. You can communicate, you have radios, you know, when they're going to hit the jump, you know, but in fly fishing, you don't know when the fish is going to hit the fly that, you know, you never can predict that. So that's one thing that makes it so challenging. Cause sometimes, you know, you're filming and your story is all based around this fish, but you might not ever see it. So what are you going to do if you don't catch that fish? Mm-hmm. It always makes for a little bit of a different story. And that's something about fly fishing that's super unique. And you always end up with a lot more footage because of it. You know, yeah. <laughs> the editing time dude, is ridiculous. Like I the Texas video. I just edited one of the days I had like five, like four hours of GoPro footage, like four straight hours. Cause we just had it running, oh. but it's like things like that. Like, you, cause you're trying to get that one eat that you might get, but you might have to go through all of that footage. So I feel like it takes so much longer editing time because you just have so much more footage. But have you found like ways around that from, you know, maybe not having to shoot as much? Yeah, it it really comes down to just like knowing when it's going to happen. Like if 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 your spidey senses are tingling, hit that record button. If you have a feeling, the slightest feeling a fish <laughs> is going to hit the fly, I kid you not, there's been plenty of times where you just get that feeling like, okay, this fish is, this is it. Like this, this is when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's, that's not very good advice. Cause that's really, dude, just- but you might, you might have that <laughs> feeling. That's the thing. I mean, yeah. I need to stop for a second. The light, uh, the light. we had, we had to let go off guys. Give us a sec. So yeah, I think we were talking kind of about just like the dynamic of filming fly fishing. And I think something we've, we've talked about like off camera before is just this idea of like really trying to understand the sport really well, like really trying to understand fly fishing before you maybe go too hard on the video. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's interesting with filming fly fishing there, the fishing itself is really intertwined with the videography. You know, you have to understand fishing. You need to know, you know, what's happening around you in order to film kind of what tells the story of what's going on. You know, you understand fishing to the, to the degree where like you just know what shots to get. Well, another thing too is just like understanding like the laws, understanding the regulations, like just understanding the ethos of fly fishing. Like don't fish on reds. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yes. Like yeah, it's understanding yeah. things like that because then you're gonna if you post something that's that's like that, you're gonna get ripped <laughs> by yeah. people. Yeah. You <laughs> exactly. You know, like fly fishing. There's a lot of ethics involved. You know, like. You don't want to you don't want to be that guy that's just holding a fish out of the water by the gills, you know, with pieces of grass on it and filming it and putting it on a commercial somewhere cuz then that's going to get a lot of blowback. You know, and if you don't understand fly fishing, you're not going to understand those little nuances that you don't you, you can't really like oh, I'm trying to put it into words. Like I see it as like you you have to understand your audience. Like who's who's your audience? And so for me, like it's a, it's a community of fly fishermen, people who are really into fly fishing in the outdoors. And so the better you understand fly fishing, the better you, that will translate, translate in your videos. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. It's hard to put it into words almost. It's like, because filming fly fishing is, is something that's so unique in, in to itself that it's like, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing sometimes, you know, it's, it's such a learning process out there. And every time you go and you film, you come back with something different and you're like, how do I put this into a video? You know, like, is this good enough? Like I have all this footage of the water of a fly floating down the river with nothing eating it. Like, what am I going to do with all that? You know? Yeah. It, Cause you have to film every cast and then you end up with, a, with a thousand casts and you, you know, <laughs> and you're like, which ones, which one do I choose? Like, 
you only need one you know like you yeah. don't what, what do you need to tell the story that's really the big thing because we've both come away with you'll shoot something you have just a ton of footage yeah and then terabytes terabytes <laughs> and it's ridiculous and you're like all right i have to cut this into a 10 minute video or maybe sometimes it's even like a three minute video so yeah uh, it's challenging it's hard to figure out what's what's the best footage and like we were talking about this the other day like getting married to footage because you'll have some stuff that you're like oh i want to work this in this is like the sickest shot but there's no place for it and sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and cut it out because it's just what's best for the overall video and what you're trying to get your viewer to see so yeah, I think one of the biggest things that I've tried, I'm trying to improve on right now, and this is really hard when it's like videos that are like sentimental to me, and like videos that like have me in it, like involved in it, and my friends in it and stuff. So basically, you as an editor have to step back, and and there might be some sentimental value of a clip that you shot. Like maybe there's a really funny moment that you filmed on the river, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, that was so funny. I remember that moment. It was great. But then when you try to translate that into the video and maybe it doesn't fit you as the editor. It's very hard when it's you and it's like your friends, but you have to step back and be like, that doesn't fit. Like I can't, I can't put that in. And that's, that's a term yeah. I was telling you. It's called like kill my, kill your darlings or kill your darlings or yeah. murder your darlings. But yeah, dude, it's, that's one of the toughest parts I would say about the editing. Yeah, it really is. You know, what do you keep? What do you don't keep? Cause you put so much work into getting shot sometimes, you know, like, especially with time lapses, like say you're trying to set up a time lapse over the whole night and you're leaving your camera outside somewhere sketchy and you go out there in the dark in a headlamp, set it up, hit record, you use two batteries, you get up in the morning, your camera's dead, it's covered in ice and you didn't get the shot. It's like, oh, oh come on. <laughs> you know, and then you go out the next night and you try and do it again and then clouds cover the stars or something you know and that's it it just happens all the time you just got to accept it you know filming is a labor of love you have to really love what you're doing because you spend so much time doing it and so much time and effort and you know it's it's not the most lucrative career path not everyone can be a director of a hollywood film Mm -hmm. you know so you really you really got to just enjoy the process and from start to finish you know, you don't have to be the best immediately. You know, it takes years to be the best at filming or fishing or anything along those lines, any sport in general. It takes, you know, they say 10,000 hours to be a master of something. So the same goes for filming and photography. So if you just enjoy the process and then just have fun and be creative with it and, you know, roll with the punches, you'll be successful. You just got to keep at it. Yeah, and we've talked about um, gosh, you said, you said something good the other day, kind of, um, you know, like kind of letting the process run its course. Like, don't try to try to rush anything. Like you, you should be focused on how am I improving on each video that I, that I, that I film or how am I improving on each photo that I take? Mm-hmm. Not so much. You might look at a film that you see that like inspires you and you might be like, that is so sick. Like I want to make that kind of film, but like you got to understand that it takes some time to get to that point. Hmm. But so enjoy those little victories where you're like, oh, I'm seeing improvement. Even if it, even if it's just a little, little bit of improvement, you know? Because it adds up over time, you know? Like each little thing, you know, maybe one day you might finally figure out like, oh, this is what F1.8 looks like. This is shallow depth of field. Like, whoa. Like, yeah. that's so sick. Nifty 50, dude. Nifty 50, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> So you might want to just shoot everything shallow depth the field and get that really cool look, you know, and you'll go through different stages of filming like that. And like, Oh, like now I like the wide shot. Like you get up close to the fish. So it looks big. Yeah. So, you know, and each time you learn those different techniques, you learn where they kind of fit in each story you're trying to tell, because it's not going to be a film of just wide shots or a film of just nifty 50 F 1.8 shots, Mm -hmm. you know, those each shot has its place in a film. So if you, if you, if you really put all those little pieces together and have all these little tools in your toolkit, these little skills from filming, um, you, you know, you put them together and to a film and you're able to create something with intention, like, and use that shallow depth of field to tell that part of the story that you want or get that wide shot to establish the location and show where you are. So, you know, that's kind of what I'm learning 
um, that's, I, I feel like every time I start a new project, there's something that I'm working on that I really like. Like right now I'm, I'm, I'm working with 4k 120 on the R5 and I just want to shoot 4k 120 all the time. Yeah. But eventually after shooting with 4k 120 for the next month or two, that'll just have its place. And then I'll, I'll be on to the next fun little filming technique to work on. So I don't know, dude, it's interesting. <laughs> it's like these little tools that you like little things that you get into, you know, and you're like about your camera, like, Oh, I love slow-mo. Like when you first start shooting slow-mo, like, Oh my gosh, this is so sick. And like yeah. all your videos are just so much slow-mo, like way too much slow-mo. Yeah. But then you, you step back and the next one you're like, all right, you know, this is a tool that I can use. And then you learn about the next thing. It's just like adding tools to your, your toolkit, uh, along the way to, you know, eventually, I mean, there, you're ne there's never like an end point. You're always learning, which is mm -hmm. which is what I love about like filmmaking. That's oh, one of the best parts of it. It's just like fly fishing. You're always yes. learning. There's always a new technique to learn. You're going to learn the surgeon's knot, and then you're going to learn the blood knot, and then you're going to learn the double hull. You know, there's there's all these little nuances to it. And if you if you learn all the little nuances and know their little place and know when to use them, you know that's kind of what makes a master of the craft. So, mm -hmm. so you started working with Brian and working at kind of as like an imprint apprentice or having an apprentice, you know, mm -hmm. like from where you were, how has that improved your skill set and like, and just your skills with filmmaking? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I owe a lot to Brian for, you know, where I've gotten as far as fit, like being a filmer and my skill set, because, you know, like I said earlier, I, I came into, you know, this, this side of the industry, filming and photography, camera work, um, really knowing nothing before I started working with Brian and kind of, you know, working under his wing with a video camera, watching him shoot stills and seeing how he shoots and seeing where he positions himself in the field and standing next to him and seeing what angles he's getting, what lenses, you know, and just like that hands on in the field work really um, went a long way because you, when you're working with a professional, Everything they're doing is for a reason. There's a purpose behind each and every shot and each and every movement and stuff. Like, I'm obviously not looking at every single one of his settings when he's shooting, yeah. but I, I generally know what's happening. So it's like when you when you see how professionals work in the field, and you and you even just take a little bit away from it each time, eventually you'll you know get the bigger picture just a little bit more. You know, lighting different angles, lenses, like I just said, but there's a lot to be said about, you know, finding a mentor and not only just for, you know, just camera, like understanding how to actually use a camera, but the, really the business side behind it, mm -hmm. because that's what a lot of, you know, professional videography and photography is about is managing business and working with different clients and knowing how to write a proper email to someone, you know, and there's a lot of these things that I never would have known had I not you know, been around a professional and, and seen how, seen that behind the scenes stuff, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of get like that foundation and you're getting to learn firsthand, which is so unique. Yeah. I think a lot of people can learn from YouTube, but if you, you know, if you are someone that has someone, you have an opportunity and you know, somebody who you can really learn from, doesn't mm -hmm. even have to be like you work for them. Like you could just be, Hey man, like let's go out and shoot. Let's go fish sometime. You're, yeah. you, you've been photo, photo, you know, taking photos for a while. Like, let's just go let's go fish together and you just see how they take photos and just little things like that. Always being like a, you know, a student of it. Yeah. You're always a student, you know, and, and even when I'm with people who aren't necessarily professionals or people that even do work in photography, like you, you can learn even from beginners because they have a fresh view on what's happening. And it's kind of cool to see how like people choose different angles and do things differently because you know, everyone thinks differently, you know, you can't, you can't always come up with every single idea. So it's cool to look to look to other people for ideas. Obviously, you don't you don't want to take anyone's intellectual capital, but yeah, if yeah. someone's willing to share their ideas with you, it's it's pretty cool to be able to listen and, you know, especially just have someone to learn from hands on. You know, I'm one of those kids that never did well, you know, working in a big class. I always had to be in a small classroom and work hands on. So, I mean, that's just how I learned. And I learned a lot from YouTube as well. One of the things that you mentioned was was business, which I think is honestly fascinates me so much. Not like more than the filmmaking, but it's one I love the business side of it, you know. And that that I feel like is like make is like a make or break of 
how you do or how well you do in, in a career like this mm-hmm. because you you can have the best video possible but if you're not able to market yourself if you're not able to talk with clients build relationships yeah. you're not able to have any business so like what has been the biggest takeaway that you've learned from like the business side of your of your business yeah i mean wow like that's it's pretty crazy to think about that because like really you could be a, a, a very amateur photographer, someone that doesn't necessarily produce the best work in the world, but really be a great person to be around, work well with clients, be someone that can communicate well and, and work hard and, and still get by, you know, mm-hmm. you don't have to be the best. You don't have to shoot the best shots ever. You don't have to be like An- Ansel Adams, you know, yes. <laughs> to, to, to get, to make a living in what we do. So, you know, really just being able to work with people and be someone that works hard, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Like filming is a lot of work. You're carrying light stands and all this heavy gear around everywhere with you. You're getting bit by mosquitoes. The sun is shining bright and you're getting sunburned and you're standing in the cold and you have to be able to deal with those things. And in a professional setting, you have to do that without complaining and you have to be able to do it and still pre- you know, provide something in the end, you know, you can't accidentally erase your cards, you know, you could take <laughs> yeah. the best shot in the entire oh, world Biggest fear. and then erase your card on accident and then you have nothing. So, you know, it's really just being responsible and working hard and thinking about what you're doing and acting with intent. You know, that's really what has allowed me to be somewhat successful in business. You know, I'm still learning, still you know, always trying to find more clients and still building that base. Cause you know, I'm still a young guy. Most of the older guys have put in many, many years to get to where they are. So, yeah, you know, Oh yeah. <laughs> well, dude, one of the things that is, is different from yours, like what you do compared to what I do is a lot of the filming that I'm doing is, it's usually just me or maybe me and one other person. Um, but what's it like working with the crew and how does that impact the, the production process for you guys? Yeah, that's, I mean, I love working with the crew because it really allows you to focus on your job. You know, working as a one man band, you're the audio guy, you're yeah. the camera guy, you're the lighting guy, you're the production designer, you're the director, you know, you're, you're putting on all these hats. But when you're on a film crew, usually you only have a few hats and, you know, you got to be able to tackle problems and and do things that might be outside of your realm here and there. But for the most part, I'm really just focused on either, you know, operating camera or editing or whatever my specific job is on that shoot. Like um, when I work with Off The Grid, I don't know if you guys know, but I work for a production company called Off The Grid Studios. Um, We do films for the Fly Fishing Film Tour and some other commercial work here and there. Um, But we work with a team of people, you know, Troy, our audio guy, will be solely focused on getting audio. So that just takes a lot of weight, you know, off of my back or Brian's back or RA's back or Sean's back is, you know, that is his sole job. Troy is there with the mic getting audio because then we can just focus on getting the proper camera angle. Mm -hmm. And when you work in a crew and everyone is putting the proper amount of energy into their job, you know, when you combine all that, you usually turn out with a better product rather than putting 10% of your energy into audio and another 20 into the video and another 20 into the production side. So you end up with a, with a higher, with a higher value product in the end, you know? Yeah. Cause you can, like you said, you can focus on your, your exact task that you need to be, you know, you're the, you're the video guy. Yeah. Focus on getting the video shots and then someone else can focus on audio for like interviews or whatever. Mm-hmm. But how, how has worked working in a crew translated over to you and your YouTube stuff or it's typically like just you? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Cause I have learned a lot working on a crew that, you know, has helped with my YouTube videos. Um, we did this series, um, for meat eater called DOS boat. And I remember when we, when we did that, we filmed the first series on GH five, the same camera that I use for YouTube. And it's kind of cool because that's a YouTube channel and I'm, a, uh, and I run a YouTube channel Yeah, and they're, and they're all YouTube videos, but one was filmed by a crew of like 10 dudes and the other was filmed by one guy. So like, what's the difference, you know? And it really comes back to like putting on all those hats. But when you get the idea 
of what other people are doing in the field and you're working together and you see all these production techniques, um, you can kind of downsize that to YouTube, you know, like I might not be able to carry around the same lighting that a lighting guy would be carrying around, but I can use the similar lighting techniques that, you know, I've learned from working on a crew and apply it in the field. You know, sometimes I'll carry like a reflector around. It's right, much right. smaller than a light, but I can still manage it and put it on a stand. You know, I'm shooting or just a lot. position in, you know, like, like you you can just position with natural light too. Yeah, exactly. Natural light. It's all. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's so many things you can do with less gear, but still using similar techniques, you know? Um, and that's, and that's really what's cool about YouTube is that, and especially these days with the advance and all this technology that we have at our fingertips, all these tiny little lights that are super powerful, you know, these lightweight carbon fiber tripods and yeah. these insane like light, 4K dude, it's cameras. It's so tiny, but it's like so bright, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, it's cool because you can, you can bring all these pieces of gear with you and still like use them just for YouTube videos, yeah. like solo film, you know? And, and that's really cool. And that, and being able to apply that sort of like, larger scale film budget technique of filming mm -hmm. to YouTube and, you know, running around solo with a camera, you can really improve the quality of your videos with just a few little things here and there. And it really comes to show that like knowing how to actually do certain things properly, you know, with the camera or with your gear can go a long ways in helping, yeah. you know, create a good video. Oh, totally. Dude, what was it like for you when you, when you started, cause I'm curious, <laughs> but what was it like for you when you started vlogging and like filming yourself? Yeah, that was, that was awkward. <laughs> That's what I feel like. It was so <laughs> awkward, dude. You like turn the camera on and you're just like, you say something you're like, God, that sounds so bad. And you like restart, you know? <laughs> yep. And I'm still doing that today. Like when we were filming oh, yeah. this, I'm still doing the same thing. So, I mean, th those days, when I, when, when you first start filming yourself, it's always going to be awkward and, and I'm still not used to being on camera, but at a certain point you just got to like get past the fact that you're pointing a camera in your face and what the real goal is, is to tell the story. And if you're the person that has to do that by, you know, vlogging or doing what you got to do, then, then just do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's my take on it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the story, we talk about this, like the concept and the story is so important. Mm -hmm. I almost think like concept is more important than production value because yeah. it, and the, this applies especially to YouTube Yeah. because there are so many really good YouTube videos that were shot on a point and shoot. They were shot on a cell phone, but they have a really good concept that's keeping you engaged, you know? And I don't know. That's what I just, I love nerding out on, on YouTube stuff and just like, it's, it's kind of like what it was meant to be. It was like home videos that can tell a good story. It's the content, man. Yeah. Content is king. Yep. You know, and that's, and that, uh, that's so true. It's like, yeah, the, it's, it goes back to the whole thing with the GoPro, right? It's like, you can film really good shots on a red, you, but are you ever going to get the same shots that you're going to get with a GoPro with a red? No, you know, that's, that's just never going to happen. The production value of a GoPro isn't as high as a red, obviously, but if you get the shot and you get that shot of whatever you're trying to get with a GoPro, you like a hook set or like, something like that. You have a hook set or like water splashing on something, or like you mount a GoPro on like a lure and cast it into the water or something crazy like that. You're never going to get that with any other camera. Yeah. So you just got to use whatever camera you have. You know, there's an old saying, it's like the camera that you have is the best camera. Or yeah, something yeah, like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's, and and that really goes goes to show like if you get the shot, it's it's really the content of the shot mm -hmm. that matters. It's not how good the shot looks always. If I mean if you can get the shot looking good, make the shot look good. Yeah. Like film it with a red if yeah. you if you can. <laughs> yeah. But not all of us can. <laughs> yeah. I mean if you're out there and you're coming up to a spot and it's coming up quick, and all you have is your GoPro in your pack and like you have your bit your your big camera Let's say in the back, but it's gonna take you two minutes to set it up mm. Just pull the GoPro out and yeah. get that if they're about to get a hook set get that shot Like it it's gonna be so much better than if you just don't get the shot, you know Like it's yeah. okay if you shot with the GoPro it looks great. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm not gonna lie one of my pet peeves is watching fishing videos and then seeing someone casting and fishing and then they're just the next shot is them just hooked up 
you know dude and that's <laughs> that happens occasionally on a trip where you just you have that missing piece like the, maybe the camera messed up or maybe you know something happened where like you don't have that hook set it's like that missing puzzle piece yeah and you're like gosh i just need that piece and then it'll make sense <laughs> yeah you can't always get those shots and it, that's what, what it all comes down to like you said man if you can get it and you can grab your phone or your gopro and just you know get the shot of the eagle or get the shot of the osprey scooping the fish out of the water you know just oh totally <laughs> just get it <laughs> just get it well so we've got we've got like a q a section coming up here for you guys we we asked y'all to um send us some questions on instagram but since we're on this topic I, there was a question about gopros and like how let me just pull it up so we so we have it i'll just read this one and then we'll, we'll get into the q a in a sec but we had, we had a couple questions kind of on GoPros and kind of how to shoot GoPros like more cinematically. And so this, uh, Nolan Alos asked, uh, advice for shooting with GoPro and overall advice for getting started in flashing film. So we'll focus on the, like kind of the GoPro part since we're, since we're just talking about that. Yeah. There's some, there's some key elements to that, you know, um, shooting in the pro tune settings is a good place to start. Um, I might give away a few little secrets here. Yeah. Not all not but, all the secrets. <laughs> not all the secrets. Personally, I just like to shoot with the flatness low. Um you, you want I mean high, you want it to be very flat. Yeah. The flattest image you can get pretty much cuz in post you usually come back in and add the color, you know, change the sharpness and and and, and basically regenerate the image in a sense. Get, take it from that flat image and add the colors. Um, but that's what allows you to get the most dynamic range, you know, because GoPros have a very small sensor. They're not a full frame sensor like these other cameras that we're using. Um, so they just don't have as good of a look straight out of camera unless you dial in the settings perfectly. But if you get the settings dialed, you know, you can really get some decent shots with GoPros. With the stabilization these days, if you have the stabilization turned on and you shoot in a pretty wide format, like it's hard to see shakes. So that's one thing that separates the newer GoPros from the older ones. Um, you know, my best advice would be if you have an older GoPro, it might be time to upgrade because the Hero 8, Hero 9 these days is insane. Dude, it's nuts. Like I was telling you earlier, I was shooting with the Hero 9 today um, just, just for fun, just some skiing stuff. But it's got this new stabilization in it, and it gets the skyline in it, like stable, yeah. and it's insane, dude. I I was skiing down handheld, and it looked like it was on a gimbal, which is nuts. It's insane. So I don't care what anyone says. GoPros are deadly. It's all about how you use them, and so I think when you're talking about the pro tune and shooting in a flat image, you want to shoot at a flat image with the GoPro because gives you more room to work in post mm -hmm. so it's like if you just shoot auto settings on the gopro you know it's just going to give you the gopro's colors like the automatic colors mm -hmm. but if you if you, if you want to maybe mess with it and post a little more and it make it look a little more film like then protein is going to be the way to go exactly and if you're filming with other cameras too it's a lot easier to match the colors when you film mm -hmm. in that flat profile because you can film on flat profiles with most every camera that's newer these days, they come with S log or C log or V log, you know, those log formats that um, you're able to match with other cameras. So they might not look exactly alike. I mean, every camera has their own flat profile that, you know, is with that certain brand or whatnot. Um, but yeah, in the end you can get some pretty good shots with GoPros if you know how to use them properly. Definitely one of those underutilized tools that I've had in a while. And I was like, all right, I need to start using the GoPro more. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Ever since the stabilization on that eight, man, I use it way more than I ever have. In the FPV? In the FPV. <laughs> did oh, you yeah. lose one? Yeah, I did. <laughs> that was the whole reason I upgraded, actually. I was flying the Hero 5 on the FPV drone and um, came down a little hard, lost to the GoPro in the woods and decided to um, upgrade instead of buy a metal detector. <laughs> <laughs> they gave you a reason to upgrade, which is not bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it, it really made a huge difference too. So thanks. Yeah. I'm really glad that I crashed it. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's totally okay. <laughs> it's all good. Well, I, I want, I'm interested to go back to the, especially with your YouTube videos, like when you're filming fishing, it's, 
it's hard to just rely on the fish to tell the story. Because mm-hmm. I think when I was first getting into this, it was like, if we didn't catch any fish, there was no video. But sometimes you just have to tell the story. And there has to, you can't rely on the fish. But what are some ways you've kind of like gone around or gotten around that? And just working through a, a fishing video, even if they're, even if the fishing is slow. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, fishing is not an easy sport as all of you probably know, <laughs> you know, there are days you go out there and you don't get everything. And there are days you go out there with a the camera crew and you don't get everything. You know, you might not even catch one fish and sometimes you still have to come out on top, especially like if it's a professional shoot and you have a client that needs you to produce something, you know, what do you do if you don't get any fish? I mean, having a backup plan is crucial, you know, like say you're gathering some marketing content for a lodge somewhere. This is actually a real example that happened recently. We were down in Belize and there was a hurricane that rolled through while we were on a shoot to go catch a permit for a video. We were making a sizzle reel to promote a lodge, <laughs> Belize Permit Club. Great lodge, highly recommend it. There you Will go. Flax, a great guy. And um, we went down there and this hurricane rolls through. Zero fish to camera after a whole week of fishing in the rain, getting pounded by the wind and the waves, getting our gear wet. You know, we were filming with trash bags over our cameras, like in the rain, trying to get just one fish on camera and it didn't happen. But we had a backup plan. You know, we made some instructional videos um, and there's, there's always something that you can do to resolve the situation. And it really comes down to being like a creator. You know, when you're a creator, you're in control of what you're putting out there. You know, you're, you're the one creating it. Mm -hmm. So you have to just be able to adapt to each scenario and, you know, focus on what's really important. Like fishing is not all about the fish. If you're fishing just to catch the fish, you're, you're probably missing out on some other cool stuff that's happening as well. Yeah. Because, you know, when you, when you go fly fishing, you're usually in a pretty cool place with insane stuff around you. You know, like we're surrounded by mountains and rivers and, eagles and bears and all these cool things you know just film that you know and you can always end up with some cool b-roll and come up with a cool story about how you went out there and you gave it your best and sometimes that's what happens so my best advice is just adapt and evolve with the situation and focus on things outside of fishing for a little bit and maybe the fishing will happen because there's definitely times when you're out there putting too much pressure on yourself and you're trying so hard to catch a fish, mm-hmm. but the fish might not even be where you're fishing, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. You just need to st- take a step back, you know? Yeah. And when, so when you're like putting together these videos, especially, especially like the YouTube ones, um, are you, do you have like a, a plan going in? Like, is there a pre-production kind of phase for you? Like where you're, you're mapping out kind of what you want this, the story to be like, or is it typically like, let's go out, shoot, shoot some video of us fishing and see what, see what comes of it. Like, how does that work for you? I mean, a little bit of both, you know, there's definitely some videos where it's like, all right, I have a weekend to go fishing. Um, let's go on an adventure and just see what happens and document it. Like that's always fun. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's, it's kind of an easy way to approach it too, in my opinion, because, um, you know, you don't have to put a whole lot of effort into creating a story. And that's really nice sometimes to just go out and film and just have a good time with the camera, with the bros and get on yes. the drift boat and just, and just, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there's other times when I feel driven to like come up with a story and, you know, really tell something that might be a little bit more than just an adventure fly fishing trip. You know, like maybe there's like an environmental issue that needs to be brought to light and you have to do a little research and dig a little deeper than just, you know, going fly fishing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to me, it's like it's for fun. I want to I want to enjoy the process of creating a video. So re- it it's it really comes down to that current moment like what is the goal here? Like what do I feel like doing first of all? Like what's what's available? Mm-hmm. What's what's the current situation and you know how how do how do you see it turning out in post? Cuz there's the, there's three films basically. There's the film that is scripted 
there's the film that's filmed, and then there's the film that's edited. And all of them are different things, and you have to adapt like to that. each part of the process. So, Yeah, no, that's good. Because there's things, like, you can ha- have the idea, you know, the initial idea and, like, how you're going to shoot it. But then you might go into post and be like, oh, we could let's switch things around really quick. Mm-hmm. Like, let's move this over here. And then it looks it looks a little bit different. You're like, wow, it's a completely new product. Yeah. But I don't know. What, what, what do sure you like? What do you like that. better? Um, do you like the editing process or do you like the filming and like scripting and like uh, planning process? Better? Oh, dude, that's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, all of it is fun. It's it's hard to choose one. I mean, the field work it's it's hard to beat because that's that's where a lot of the you know experience is had and you know you're not sitting in a chair <laughs> you're not looking at a screen yeah so that's that's definitely enjoyable but a lot of the magic really does happen in post because you th- see things that you might not have been paying attention to in the field or like in the moment and then you get back and you and you're looking through the footage and they're they're you got to figure out how to turn these pieces of the puzzle into the finished product. And, and you're, and you're chiseling away at a block, creating something that is totally, totally new. You know, it, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole process and they really both complement each other. Yeah. You know, as a filmer, I couldn't choose just one to focus on because being an editor helps with filming and being a filmer helps with editing. But, in the end, I would probably say that I do like the camera work the most because, you know, being outside and and exploring and traveling is a really fun process on itself. So, yeah. and also I'm still learning editing. I'm not a master of it yet. I feel like if I, if, if I were to pick a skill that I have, it'd probably be the filming part because there's some editing that is totally beyond my capabilities. There's some technical stuff like after effects and all these oh, programs. Yeah. I don't even just... bother. <laughs> <laughs> I've been like avoiding after effects for so long. Like I eventually want to learn more about it, but it's just, I don't know. Like you can do a lot in premiere. You can do yeah. a lot in iMovie. Like you can, that's the thing, dude. So many people ask like what, you know, what editing software you use? Like, you know, what should I use to get into? And it's like, whatever is available yeah. for you, you know, use that and figure out how you can use again, that editing software to the best of its ability. And it's, it's basically just like, like if you think of like someone who's like sculpting something, mm-hmm. you know, it's like you're sculpting the story through this editing software. Um, and they're all kind of different, but they all are the same. Exactly. Like it doesn't really matter. Um, do you, you use Premiere though? I'm guessing, right? I do. I use Premiere Pro. Yeah. I used Final Cut for a number of years, um, and then I started working with a team, and everyone uses Premiere. So if we're sending files to each other, it's just a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Premiere's Premiere's a great program, but like you said, they all do a great job. Even iMovie is awesome because when it comes down to it, the foundation of video editing is just making cuts and splicing clips together, mm-hmm. and then you know tweaking your audio here and there and pretty much every program can do that yeah so really the the really techie stuff separates the programs the professional programs from the entry-level programs like the transitions the titles and graphics and keyframing and you know we can go down a long yeah. road <laughs> yeah, like, what, are we, what are those guys talking about <laughs> no exactly I, I remember getting premiered just like initially when i first got it i just like <laughs> You know those like zoom transitions people used to use? I just like yeah. wanted to figure that out. I was like, I need that in my video. <laughs> <laughs> like that's so sick. <laughs> and this and then I like figured out you could, there's like a preset you just like throw on. But then after a while you're like, This like what? Why am I doing this? This is adding no value to my story. <laughs> it's just yeah, like exactly. you're zooming to a random clip. <laughs> but I don't know. That's just I yeah. feel like a lot of people glamorize the little like transitions and stuff over over the story. Yeah, I think transitions are best kept simple, you know. You don't want it to be distracting, you know. If you watch most Hollywood films, you're not seeing crazy, like, twist zoom, yeah. like, transitions and, like, all this stuff. You'll see crossfades, you'll see L cuts, you'll see J cuts. You'll see, like, these simple cuts that just, you know, smoothly transition things from one subject to another. And that's all you really need to do, you know, in order to tell your story. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it depends what you're doing. Sometimes those crazy transitions and cuts are really good if you're editing something like for a commercial, like if it's like quick and bouncy, you need something that's like 
a hype, com- kind of a hype commercial. Yeah, you know? something like that. But so, like, when you're getting into this, wh- who, is there anyone that comes to mind that like was a big inspiration for you? Being like, I want to get into filmmaking, and like this, this is like who I like got me into it. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know if you guys will recall a film called Eastern Rises. It's I've seen it. it's, yeah. it's a pretty epic fly fishing film um, filmed in Kamchatka, Russia. I'll never forget the first time I watched that. And this is when I was first beginning as a fly fisherman too, you know, early days back when I was in college and stuff and saw this film and I was like, wow, like I want to create something like that. Like that truly inspired me to not only just like fish more, but to also operate a camera and, and get more into f- fly fishing filming. Cause it was so influential, you know, the stuff that, um, the guys that felt soul create is some of the best work in my opinion. And, mm-hmm. and, and they re- definitely were a big influence on, um, I, I guess getting into fly fishing filming. Yeah. So, Dude, I remember watching that like the night before we'd go on like a fishing trip just to get stoked for the next night. And like, it was, dude, it was, I don't know. There's like, there's like certain feeling that you get when you're really new to the sport and you're just like, you, you see it, you find a cool film and you watch and you're just like so stoked to go fish the next day. And I think that's one of the coolest things about like what we do is like we're able to, yeah. even if we don't realize it all the time, it's like we're able to uh, offer that up for, for certain people, you know, and just yeah. share that experience that we love with an audience of people who are, who, who enjoy the same thing. Yeah, that's that's what's so cool, man, is that's like almost what it's about. It's like getting an audience to feel how you feel when you're out there on the water. You know, that level of stoke that you get when something incredible happens and all the stars align and maybe you get that permit to hand or that bonefish or that big brown or something. That experience, being able to catch that on camera and and tell it and tell that story and have the viewer feel the way you felt and Mm -hmm. and being able to like put someone in your shoes when you're out there, like, and it's actually happening is insane. You know, that's, that's part of what makes filming cool is being able to tell that story and, you know, make a viewer feel that certain way like that. You know what I mean? It's It's, like, like you want to, when you're editing it, you're like, you know how it, you you know how it was when you experienced it and you've got mm -hmm. it filmed and it's like, how can I transition that? Or how do I translate that over through the video to mm-hmm. the audience? Because I want them to like feel that same thing, you know? Yeah, and I think I think YouTube is one of the biggest things with YouTube is is really just the relatability. Like I always try to make stuff that's like relatable for the audience, mm-hmm. because I don't claim to be anything. I don't I don't try to claim to be any pro or anything like that. But it's like I want to make stuff that like you or whoever else is watching like might might be able to go experience as well. Like they can just get the boys in the truck get the get the rods in the back and just go head out for an afternoon you know like stuff like that yeah. is so it's is so relatable and i think that's like what people can connect with yeah exactly it's it's cool to be able to watch videos like your videos especially man like you you tell the whole story in a way where you're out there and you're filming and you and you get that b-roll of just getting in the truck and getting your chick-fil-a sandwich and whatnot. yeah yeah and it makes you feel like you're you're there and you're doing it and you're experiencing the, that awesome day with the homies going out fly fishing because not everyone can do that all the time it's cool to be able to you know get that experience from sitting on the couch somewhere where it might be you know 20 below and you can't go fishing mm-hmm. but you want to go fishing so you watch a sick fly fishing video yeah and it, it brings you back to being on the river standing in waders you know making that perfect loop cast oh yeah yeah no exactly all right so before we get into the questions i'd love to hear because you've been able to film in some really cool locations in some really unique locations which is sick but what what would you say has been your favorite place that you've gone so far wow yeah i've been pretty fortunate but honestly if i could pick one location that i'd go back to that i would probably live and probably never want to leave is <laughs> Patagonia, man. Oh my gosh. Argentina is so freaking sick. I mean, it's just a wild, wild place. It's like the West was like 50 to 100 years ago, maybe. You know, there's still cowboys, the gauchos down there. You know, you have these mountains that aren't 
covered in trees on the top and it's low elevation. It's got this like alpine, like crazy gnarly feeling to it. And it's really windy and there's all these crazy plants that don't grow here and animals you don't see here, but Mm -hmm. it's still just like the Rocky mountain West, just on the opposite side of the world, you know? Yeah. And it's also got incredible fly fishing, incredible food, incredible culture. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very unique place. And if anyone who's watching this hasn't been there, I know it's probably not the easiest place to get to and not everyone can go there, but if you get a chance in your entire life, if, if I could go one place for the rest of my life, that would probably be a bucket list trip, bucket list trip kind of deal. I feel like I've never been there, but I feel like everything there and a lot of the rivers are just so like so untouched and just so out there. Like you feel like you're just like, there's no human interaction with, with the fisheries there. Yeah. You can, you can get way out there. I mean, these days are the, the main fishing interaction is from us, you know, traveling anglers that go down there on guided trips. Usually. Um, I mean, there are some local anglers as well too, but a lot of the fishing you'll do is on gaucho land. Um, or like private land that people gain permission to, or, you know, have Mm -hmm. deals with uh, the local landowners to gain access to these stretches of water. There's not a ton of public water. Um, but the, the water there, it varies a lot. There's spring creeks, there's big rivers, there's freestones, there's tailwaters, you know, it's very similar to the American West, but Um, it's, it's very different in a lot of ways as well. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's insane. Dude, that's sick. I'm definitely jealous. I I need to make it down there eventually. I think it'd be, uh, be fun to roll, roll the bus into Patagonia. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The short bus could definitely get down to Patagonia, dude. Yeah. You can get down there. You don't even have to drive it back. Just, you know, we'll probably just leave it there. Just leave it there. Blow it up or something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, dude. One day. I had you guys send us some uh, some questions on Instagram, just about videography, editing, YouTube, kind of anything along those lines. So we're gonna go through a couple of these. Hopefully, give our two cents based on our experience and what we've learned. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll help answer some of these. But we'll start from uh, start from the top from Thomas Philip. He said, "Any top tips for beginners on the editing side of video production?" Yeah, well, it's I mean editing is overwhelming at first, you know, just learning how to use the program and and manage your footage um, I mean Beginning just from downloading your cards from managing your footage from the card um, Is is a hard process in itself that took me a while to figure out like I was buying multiple memory cards and just saving the cards Not even no like, way. Re- <laughs> yeah, dude, and you just plug them in and then just not use when it was full it was like all right let's get another memory card Dude, that's crazy (laughs) i had no idea what i was doing yeah but you know that's exactly the the point though it's like when you're a beginner you don't really know all these things because no one taught you you have to figure out the hard way sometimes but yeah like on the editing side if you can learn how to manage your footage and and sort your library and really just start off before you even get into the editing program with a very organized palette, then you'll be able to go into the editing and know where all your footage is. Cause I mean, the first thing you gotta do when you download all your footage is make a folder on an external hard drive. Don't use your computer's hard drive, you Mm -hmm. know, cause then your, when your computer fills up with memory, not many computers have a ton of memory. Most of them have a terabyte or less, and that's really nothing. Mm -hmm. Once you get into video production, you'll realize that a terabyte fills up like, in a yeah. day this video is probably going to be a <laughs> yeah <laughs> showing three cameras in 4k yeah for sure yeah. exactly so yeah store all your stuff on an external hard drive make a folder i what i'd like to do is have a folder for my video have the premiere folder have the footage folder have the audio folder and have everything nice and clean and organized before you even start your editing process and then once you do that you put it in premiere or imovie or whatever program you're using and just look through your footage you know before you even start editing go through all of it and see what you have like you you have to know what footage you have before you can edit it 
Like if you just started editing your footage from the beginning without even looking through it, you might get through it and realize that you have a shot that would have worked somewhere else or in a different part. You wouldn't even know what footage you had. So it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't even really work. So yeah, it's starting from the beginning with a clean, with a clean, with a clean slate, you know, with everything organized properly, knowing your footage, that's, that's really the best place to start as a beginner. And, you know, it doesn't matter what program you're using as much as just being able to, you know, organize your footage well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can do, you can make a great movie on iMovie, you mm -hmm. know, so. It, yeah, because you're working with sometimes days of footage. So you got to have like, all right, we're shooting at this location. So it's like day one. Yeah. Sony footage, GoPro footage, drone footage. All right, day two. And like keep it organized because then when you dump that into your, your editing software, it's going to be that much easier to, to go through. But w really quick, what do, you, what do you do when you talk about cutting footage and going through footage? Because mm -hmm. I do the same thing. But what do you do when you dump your footage into Premiere? How do you set that up so it's organized in Premiere? or in like your editing software? Yeah, it usually mirrors my folders on my hard drive. So, you know, I'll have day one, day two, day three with each camera on it, just like what you're saying. Like that's crucial. Um, and yeah, when I go in Premiere, I'll drag and drop essentially the same folder so it mirrors it. So I know exactly where it is on the hard drive because mm -hmm. there's a lot of times when you'll edit a video, you'll finish it up, you'll wrap it up, but you'll have to go back to it and you'll have to be able to find certain shots and know where everything is. So like, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to know where all your footage is and organize it properly from the moment you import it. Yeah. You know, and, mm -hmm. and always clear your cards afterwards too, because sometimes you'll put your card back in your camera and keep filming on it and then you'll download your footage and you won't know which footage on your card is on your hard drive and yeah. you can double download sometimes or you might not download everything. So if you download your footage, you double check, everything's been downloaded, then you clear your card. It's a scary feeling. It's a very scary feeling. <laughs> it always is. You'll never- <laughs> You're I, like, I see the footage right there, but I'm terrified to hit format. <laughs> every single time, I'm always scared. <laughs> It is literally the one of the worst parts about my day is clearing that card. <laughs> <It's romantic laughs> card. Always puts a knot in my stomach. But once you do it, then you'll know that you'll come back to the download the next day and everything on the card needs to go in that folder for that day. You just drag and drop the whole thing. It's all on the hard drive and then you clear your card again and mm -hmm. then it's good to go. And when I'm on a shoot that really matters, I always bring a second hard drive and mirror the first hard drive onto that second hard drive gotcha. so that you have two copies of everything. It's not going anywhere because hard drives do go bad. And if you're traveling, give your give someone you're traveling with the other hard drive and you take the second hard drive to make sure none of that footage gets lost because you put two weeks into a shoot and that whole two weeks of work and travel and everything relies on that hard drive. Oh my gosh. And that is a stressful feeling. Yeah, it's like if there's a fire in your house, what's the first thing you grab? My hard drive. <laughs> yes, I have a fireproof safe that I keep my hard drive. Oh, in. that's clutch. Yeah, all of them go in there. So, brilliant. I brilliant. can't. I can't even stress how important it is to protect your assets. You know, absolutely. Okay, so this is a good one. This is from Frosty on the Sauce. Nice, nice Instagram handle, dude. Saucy. <laughs> he said, uh, "What made you want to start recording?" Yeah, I mean. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with, you know, trying to, you know, transmit those feelings of stoke to people that are watching the video, you know, because fly fishing gets me really stoked. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it gets all of you stoked. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the best things you can experience in life. And being able to capture that on camera and you know, be able to replay that and, and share those moments, those like really insane things and cool things that happen on the river is what got me into recording, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's like that, it's that feeling you get when you watch a really cool video and it makes you really excited to do something. It's like, that's that's what got me to, to start filming, you yep. know? And it's, and it's just a really fun process that you can enjoy the whole way through of making a video. I mean, it's it, again, it's just enjoying the process and it's just so fun just being creative and getting different camera angles and, and using, and using all these pieces of gear and just like yeah. hanging out with your friends and 
I don't know the whole the whole process. There's so many fun. aspects to it, and it, I think it's cool. It's it's really cool to see, especially after years of doing it, like being able to look back and be like, "Wow, I've made progress." Mm-hmm. Even if it's just a little bit of progress on something, like being able to see that you've grown because you've put in a bunch of time, and you're seeing that you're getting better at it. And you're getting better at it. It's like fly fishing. The more time you spend, you're getting better and better and better. And I don't know that that feeling is just so. I don't know. I gravitate towards that. It's rewarding. Um, man. It's very rewarding. That improving is so rewarding, you know, and yeah, you can progress a lot from the point that you start filming to, you know, so somewhere later in your career. And if you're not, then you should probably pick another hobby to yeah. be quite honest. Yeah. Especially in this industry, <laughs> do not get into this if you're trying to make a lot of money. Like there, no. there is opportunity to make money in this industry for sure, especially in the video side. But you got to, I feel like getting, getting into it, you have to be in the right, with the right intentions. It's a labor of love. You have to really enjoy it um, and, and not have huge expectations for money. But then if that comes, great. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, that's okay. You enjoy doing it, you know? Yeah. And it'll come. It'll come. If you put in your work, it'll come around at some point. It'll, it'll all pay itself back. You have to pay your dues. Yeah. You know, just like anything else. Like totally. Yeah, that's good. (laughs) From from Dr. E. W. J. said, how does he stay so stoked? Will, how do you stay so, so, so stoked, dude? Oh, man. <laughs> the, the best way to stay stoked is to do stuff that makes you stoked. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like, living here, we're fortunate enough to have access to a lot of really cool rivers and amazing resources at our fingertips. Um, you know? And it's... And we and, and and we're fortunate enough to have the time to be out and go fly fishing and do things outdoors, you know. And that's really what it comes down to is just is just doing it. If I have time, I'm gonna go fish. I'm mm-hmm. gonna go film. Like if I'm not I'm not gonna sit around and just watch YouTube videos, which I love doing, but I'm gonna go out and make them and just and and be out there where these things happen. That's how I say stoked, dude. It's yeah. just getting out every day as much as possible doing what I love to do. Yeah. You know, cause you do a lot. I mean, you bike, snowboard, fish, like dude, you do it, it all climb. And so, and you've got all of that here, which is pretty insane, dude. I'm quite jealous. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. And you know, I wake up every day pinching myself really thankful for just all this incredible public land that we have here in Montana. You know, if we didn't have this public land, I wouldn't have anything because like literally everything I do is on public land. Yeah. I live on like half an acre. I can't do everything here. So yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. So Aiden T Lincoln asked, do you ever deal with the insecurity of wondering whether your films are good enough to put out? I do. I absolutely do. Um, you know, what you put out there stays out there usually, you know, it could, unless you delete it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when you upload a video, it's out there for people to see. And there's definitely something about each video that I upload. It's like, okay, is this good enough? Like, do I, is this reflecting, you know, who I am as a person? Like, do I, am I proud of this? You know, is it, did I put in the proper effort here or did I just, you know, waste my time making something that isn't worthy. Mm-hmm. And and that question crosses my mind a lot. And as I improve, I look back at a lot of my older videos. I'm like, Oh, that's really not that good. Yeah. yeah. Like, Oh crap. Like I get that feeling. And you know, sometimes, you know, I don't release videos because of that. Like there's a few videos I filmed this fall that just weren't up to par and I had to bite the bullet and kill your, kill my, Murder my daughter. Murder, yeah. murder, murder your darlings. Murder yeah. my darlings. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, we're just kidding. We're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that sometimes you got to do that, you know, because it you don't want to put things out there that you're not proud of, you know, because then you're going to regret it. I mean, that's it's really important to, to put your passion into your work. And if you mm-hmm. don't feel passionate about it, it doesn't really, you know, get you stoked. Yeah. Then, then just move on to the next thing, you know, focus on what matters, Mm -hmm. you know, like one project might be kind of stale. And so I think it's good sometimes to work on 
multiple projects because there's you might be just like at a roadblock at this one project but if you step back and say all right i'm gonna go work on this other one they kind of gives you like almost like a a lift in a a way and you're like okay a a breath of fresh air like i'm gonna work on this i've got some fresh inspiration for this project and then once you you know go back to the other one all right you're good to go eventually you know no that happens and taking breaks during (laughs) editing really helps too because fresh eyes on on a project goes a long way. If you, if you're looking at the same thing for 24 hours straight, sitting in front of the computer, just grinding away, you know, we've all done it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You go into the rabbit hole of trying to get the like perfect cut or the perfect little text to align in this little like thing. And, and you get so focused on these little nitty gritty things that you forget about the big picture. So if you take a break, take a couple of days off and then go back and rewatch your edit, mm-hmm. you know, you'll see a lot that you didn't see if you're just so focused on it, you know? Yeah. So having multiple projects to work on is something that I do as well. And it, it's really healthy because then sometimes an idea will come to you while you're working on some one thing, then you can just switch back to the other and then, and then really apply, you know, something that'll fix whatever you're having a roadblock on. Exactly. Yeah. And I think uh, another thing to like close out this question that, um, that this is something that stuck with me because I feel like I'm, you know, like a lot of people who do video are like perfectionists. And I feel like that's something I've always struggled with is being a perfectionist. Like it has to be perfect. But something I read recently was, was like a good book that's released is better than a perfect book that never gets released. So if you think of your video of, you know, like perfectionism is like the enemy of good enough. And so if you release a video that is like, you know, you feel proud of but you're like, oh, it's not perfect, but it's still good enough. That's better than not releasing it at all, you know? Yeah. And I feel like that that happens so often with 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 editing and filming. It's like you get into these roadblocks and you're like, oh, it's just not good. But like if you put it out there you know, it's, it's better than if it, if it wasn't even like created, like you, you're like, Oh, I have this cool yeah. vision, but then if you don't ever create it, then it, it's never, it's never created. You know, it's just an idea. Yeah. It's kind of like what people say about artwork or artists will say about artwork. Like it's never finished. Like some pieces of art are just never finished. You know, they're always, you you can always make it better. There's always something you can do with the video to make it better, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I always look back on, videos that I released and I'm like, Oh, I could have done this. I could have done that. I kind of wish that I just spent another day editing it and tweak this and that here and there. But you know, at some, at a certain point you just have to, you have to, you have to make the call. Like, yeah. Am I going to put any more time into this? Like, is it worth putting an extra day into this project just to get this one little shot that ties it together? And sometimes it is, Mm -hmm. you know, but sometimes it isn't. And sometimes you just got to say, okay, this is all the time I'm willing to put in this project. I've put, you know, this amount of time and effort into it. Is this really, is it worth more than that to me? And if the answer is yes, then I'll keep going with it. But if no, it's like, okay, maybe it's time. Like it, this is when it's ready to be uploaded or this is when this project's ready to be wrapped up. Yeah. So you got to look at the story, like look at how is this, going to add value to the video Mm -hmm. if it's not if it's like just a little thing that you know you got to kind of step back and be like is this really going to make a huge difference and if it's not sorry just move on to the next thing but if if it really is like a crucial part of the story maybe you do spend a little bit more time on it yeah so exactly exactly i mean it's up to you as the creator which is the beauty of it yeah exactly (laughs) all right so this next one is from wx expeditions unlimited and he asked the best way or what's the best way to get into filming the best way to get into filming well you don't even need a camera these days because most people have phones right Mm -hmm. and i think almost every phone has a camera so if you don't even have a camera you can still film like all you have to do is film stuff yeah and if if you have something that you like to film, maybe start with that. You know, like if you're obviously most people that are watching this are fishermen. You, next time you're out on the water, just try getting a shot of anything and start editing together. You know, the first step really is being able to cut 
clips together into a video and and tell a little story from beginning to end Mm -hmm. and it doesn't really matter what that story is it's it's up to you as a creator and and just i mean my best advice is it's simply put just get out there and start filming yeah and and as you as you learn and as you go you'll figure out your direction you know Mm -hmm. you just gotta you just gotta shoot it, I I want to come up with a more complicated answer, but yeah, I mean, for like it's literally it yeah it's that it's that simple. It's like you got to start, and mm-hmm. but it's hard it's hard because you're like, what direction do I go? Like where do I? And, and that's the, that's that's where a lot of people get stuck is you overthink it. Mm-hmm. It's like just start. Yeah, you know, get out there if you got your phone and that's all, all you have. Get out with your buddies and just start filming some videos. Just start shooting, you know, take little things that you like from one guy, from another guy, take these little tools and try to, you know, mess around with them. And the more you do that, you'll kind of figure out what you like, you know, and there's going to eventually you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I've got, I kind of figure out my style. I figure out my voice in a way. Yeah. You know, so if you just kind of, like, you don't want to copy people, but there, you kind of have to chase like a style at first because you have no grounds to like of a direction where you want to go. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm sure you have, like you said, you had an influence from like felt soul and I've had influence mm-hmm. from different videos and you know, you kind of, you kind of try to make videos like that yeah. at the start, but then eventually you're like, Oh, I've got my, my path or whatever. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it is a good place to start just by getting influenced directly from other people and seeing what other people are doing mm-hmm. because you know, it gives you a good starting point because that's been that you can tell what's a good video and what's not, you know, what elements really make something that's interesting to watch and you know a good place to start would just to be document documentary filming just documenting what's going on you know go out fishing you know maybe take some selfie shots say like we're out here on the river this is what's this is what's happening this is the story you know Mm -hmm. you tell your story however you would like to tell it but um just get out there and shoot you know that's my best advice definitely um, so this next one is from Hackle and Loop, and they asked, "Does music influence your edits, or do your edits influence your choice of music?" Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, music is almost always a part of videos that mm-hmm. we create. You know, so it's it, it plays a huge role. Like sometimes the music comes before the edit, and you know what song you want to use. You might come across something and be like, "Oh, I love this song." Like. I need to throw this in the edit because like editing to the music is oftentimes, you know, what the right thing is to do. I mean, yeah. I don't know why I'm wording things bad right now. No, no. Yeah. You, Cause you want it like it's, it's you cutting hit, to, cut the, cut beat. to the beat. It's yeah. like, it's making sense. It's like, there should be a cut there, you know, because of the, the drum or like the kick drum or something, you know? Yeah. You're, you're cutting to the beat. You're making it flow. It ha- you have flow, to find yeah. that flow. Like a lot of times, I'll end up looking at my Premiere Pro o- like layout, and all the cuts are almost exactly the same length. They're like it's really symmetrical blocks, and it's like super satisfying to look at. On oh the yeah, because it'll be like perfectly with the beat, mm-hmm. you know. And like sometimes that isn't appropriate, but sometimes it is. It just depends what you're doing. Like if you're trying to make just like a sizzle reel, like a fly fishing like two, three minute video where it's just like a sick song with sick footage, like editing to the beat is almost for sure the way to go. Um, But maybe it's just like background music that's, you know, you have some voiceover dubbed and it's just like a tune and maybe you don't need to edit to the music. It's just there in the background to like supplement what's going on. So there's a couple ways of using music in videos. Like you don't have to stick to one particular method. Um, it just really depends on what project you're working on and what your goals are. Um, I mean, I would say like you, you want to pick music that goes along with your video and, and matches kind of like your audience. Cause Mm -hmm. like if I'm making a promo video for a lodge, I'm not going to use like some thug like trap music yeah, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. most, most paying clients in fly fishing, you know, are between the ages of like 30 and 60 that are going on trips to lodges around the world. They don't want to listen to that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. you, you got to think about who your audience is when you're, you know, throwing music in your videos as well. Yeah. It's got, I mean, it's got to fit like the vibe of the, the video that you're making. Yeah. And I think it's really important to also 
change up the music throughout. You don't want one constant, you know, song throughout the whole trip because it's like then your story is just flat. It's very flat. Yeah. But if you if you build up, you know, you've got some high BPM music that's like building up to this intense moment and then it like stops. Yeah, I do. And then so if you mix it up throughout the video and not just have, you know, like cuz I know we both used to like just find a sick song and then you just make a highlight reel. Yeah. But like exactly. by if you look at your YouTube retention, it's probably like after like a minute of that it's just like gone cuz yeah. they're just like oh this is the same thing. So you just need to like mix it up, I think. Yeah, your classic fly fishing music video. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, dude, that's one thing I've noticed in your videos I really like is the scoring. You know, it's almost like it's scored like a cinematic like movie kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. It's 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 that slow build up, you know. And you don't even have to use songs sometimes. You can just use elements of music. Yeah, just really simple ambient viewing. sounds that are just in the background. Like you could be like I could record you out you know, hey man, it's like four in the morning. Like we just got up. Like it's super early. We're heading out to the spot. Like something kind of dramatic. But if you put a little bit of ambient, you know, an ambient song in the background that just kind of gives a little tone, that can it make just like the mood of the video so much different than yeah. than you just saying that normally. You know, exactly. So it's like figuring out, and there's not there's not one way to do it. Like you got to figure out the way to do it. And I'm still trying to figure out like, all right, what song does this work? Like, is this work for this part? Or can I pick something else? Yeah. So you just got to, yeah, the more you do it, the more music you listen to, I feel like you'll just get a better feel for what fits in your edit. Yeah, exactly. Like, how do you want your viewer to feel? You want them to feel happy. Mm -hmm. You want them to feel sad. Like, put that kind of music in there. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Or if it's like, like we were saying, if you want them to feel like stoked, like how you felt in the moment, maybe it's like a really happy, like uplifting song. Yeah, exactly. And then that's kind of captures that, that moment. Yeah. You know? And translates it to the viewer. Well said. Very well said. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, this is a good one because we both we both do this a fair amount. But how does the dynamic of fishing change when you are by yourself and also have to film? And that's from Coleman in WNC. Yeah, the dynamic of fishing definitely changes because you're doing a lot less of it when you're <laughs> <Yeah>. filming. <laughs> A, it's harder because you're not spending as much time fishing and you're trying to catch a fish. So your chances go down mm -hmm. in actually making something happen. So that adds an element of challenge. And then you're setting up a tripod on the river a lot of the time. You know, I, 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 I like to film with my GH5 or now the R5 as much as I can yeah. because, you know, you get a better image from it. The GoPro shots have their time and place, but if I can avoid it, I usually try to. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm self filming, a lot of time I'll just set up my camera on a tripod somewhere and fish. And I like to use wireless mics, like lav mics, nice, yeah, and yeah. run those on camera, so I can at least get some audio while I'm fishing and and can speak or do some sort of interaction with the camera while I'm like standing far away fishing. You know, so I you noticed got, that with your pike film that you did. Cause there were a few shots where the camera was just set up on the side and it was such crisp audio and I was like, Oh, he's got to have a lot of mic on. And yeah, I like it. You got it. Nailed yeah. it. Nice. Yeah. Dude. The road wireless go is, has been my go-to lately. I really like that mic. It's super easy to use. You can connect a lav to it or you can just, you know, run the wireless go on its own. It's like really versatile tool, but yeah, that's an, that's something else that I want, uh, yeah, I should touch on is that like audio is such an important mm -hmm. part of bringing your viewer into your video because once you take away the audio, like you can change the whole dynamic of a video. But when, but when you have like good audio, like your story is brought to life, you know, you can really, you know, get, get your viewer to feel what's going on yeah like you what, what you feel like they're there like you're <laughs> yeah, saying exactly yeah. like that crisp audio you hear that it sets the tone like you could you could turn the video off on this podcast and just listen to us talk and you know that's still a podcast. hopefully it sounds all right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no it, it it's we talked i talked about this with brian on the podcast we were on but it, you know audio i think you like hear before you see and so mm -hmm. you know audio also makes it gives that extra feeling of like you feel like you're there kind of thing. It's such an important component to video. So yeah, when I'm, when I'm self filming, like I focus a lot on audio and then 
Yeah, we'll I'll go back into to the GoPro deal. That's also a very useful tool because mm-hmm. you can run a GoPro pretty much the whole time you're filming by yourself without having to put a ton of effort into moving tripods around and carrying tons of gear. You can hit record, leave it on your chest, fish, mm-hmm. row, do what you got to do, and, and you're able to get some cool first-person footage. So. And I think if you only have a GoPro, it it's important to mix up your shots that you're doing. So maybe do some chest shots, maybe take it off and put it on a tripod mm-hmm. because the autofocus is really good on there. I mean, it's you don't, there's no manual focus for it. Yeah. So like, <laughs> like shooting with a GoPro, you don't just need to shoot chest shots. Like if you're shooting a chest shot and you have a 30 minute video and it's a chest shot the whole time, like look at your retention rate on YouTube. It's probably not great because like, you just need to mix it up. The viewer every couple seconds needs to see something mm-hmm. different, you know? And so you can do all of that with a GoPro. That's what's awesome. Yeah. You, they're so small and you can mount them pretty much everywhere. Yes. Yeah. That's if you have a GoPro, get some mounts. I know on Amazon, you can buy these kits of mounts that are like 20, 30 bucks. They're pretty cheap mounts, but do you can job. put them on pretty much anything. Like get creative with it, mount it to the handlebars on your bike. Put it on the top of your Polaris Razor when you're ripping down the beach in Baja. You know, mount it to the front of the boat while you're bouncing through the waves, getting splashed in the storm. You know, it's yeah. like those creative angles you can get a go- with a GoPro that you would never mount your mirrorless camera to. Yeah. Because I would never dream of doing some things with my GH5 that I'd do with a GoPro. So <laughs> yeah. you can get those angles that, you know, not many other people are getting that way. So follow-up question, because you just touched on biking. I know we were talking about when we were skiing the other day of you've started to do some more filming for skiing and snowboarding this year. Mm -hmm. So what sort of, and I know you do other stuff you do, you know, mountain biking and a bunch of other outdoor activities that you already do and you film them, but how has filming those, uh, impacted your filmmaking for fly fishing? Yeah, definitely in a positive way, you know, it's getting involved in other sports and, and doing things outside of fly fishing, you know, gives you a new perspective. I mean, it's, you're using different things, right? You're, you're on a bike, you're on a board, you're, you're doing things differently. You're not, you're not dealing with a fish. So I definitely gain an appreciation for fly fishing sometimes, you know, when I'm sitting in a boat and it's 60 degrees and the sun shining and we're on the river mm-hmm. and then I'm on a s- filming skiing and you know it's five degrees it's dumping snow the snowmobile's stuck I have a bunch of camera gear you know thing yeah. <laughs> there's situations that you you don't want to be in sometimes but there's also that also goes for fly fishing so a lot of it comes down to the gear like when I film skiing I'm having to deal with like my gear getting too cold or my hands getting too cold and I learned to shoot differently just because you're dealing with different elements and you know sometimes you're filming fly fishing in the cold but I learn you know from skiing that sometimes I'll put hand warmers on my camera yeah and that'll save it so you know there's there's little techniques that'll translate from sport to sport um I mean when I film like a lot of action sports you want to have the camera moving a lot of the times you know like that's just kind of critical to you know getting that cinematic look i hate using the word cinematic I know, sometimes I know. it's so oversaturated it is but you know there's there's certain things that you apply to action sports that are, when you apply them to fly fishing it really works yeah so i don't know it definitely works hand in hand doing different types of sports because it brings a new perspective to filming fishing that's that's really what it comes down to is it is that mixture of filming techniques always translates over and you can learn something from doing something differently. And yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you're only filming fishing videos and that's all, you know, so if you, you know, go outside your comfort zone and film stuff, that's like totally different from fly fishing. You're going to have to change the game up a little bit. And that's going to eventually apply to fly fishing. So yeah, exactly. You're just dealing with different elements. You're dealing, you know, with the cold, you're dealing with dust, especially mm-hmm. mountain biking, like out here in Montana, like it gets super dusty. So yeah, my camera gear just gets covered in dust. So I end up using like the rocket blower a lot. And sometimes I'll bring 
um, those compressed air cans to get all the dust off my camera, you know, and that'll be helpful sometimes. Like you can be filming in dusty environments and fishing and, you know, yeah, I don't know. That's really what it comes down to is just operating in different elements and being able to adapt and overcome certain situations. And a lot of it does come down to the gear and yeah. dealing with how, how well your gear copes with things and fishing we deal with a lot of salt water. So being able to protect your camera from the salt and you know, like when I'm in Belize, it's so cold and inside with the air conditioning, you go outside, your gear immediately fogs up. So stuff like putting your camera outside while you're sleeping can really help mitigate, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you're in a humid place and you walk outside and it's like your camera just fogs up. It's yeah. Cool. And if that happens to your sensor, good luck. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, <laughs> dude. You you want some flat footage? <laughs> High <laughs> dynamic range? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There just you go down go. to Alabama, man. <laughs> yeah, just get your camera gear all foggy. There's your, there's your vlog. Yeah. So this next question from Gatewood Brown, he said, what is your favorite part of making a video and favorite way to retain an audience? Hmm. I mean, I'm still, I'm still learning that, how to retain an audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, looking at YouTube analytics, I was just talking with you the other day, like it's, it's interesting going through analytics and seeing where people like skip out on videos and and stay and drop, in, off. and drop off so like i don't know it's hard to tell you know exactly what retains an audience i mean you just want to have that build up really like my my in my opinion like i like videos that kind of start off slow but exciting like have that intro like you want to grab your viewer mm -hmm. right off the bat you know, they want to be stoked on what's going on, but then you want to build up to something that's a climax, you know, your classic yeah. story arc. Like you have to have all the elements of a story for it to be exciting. Like if you don't have a climax of your story, then, you know, why, why, why are we even watching the video? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, that's to me, that's what I like to do to retain an audience is like kind of have like tease at something that's building up towards a climax, make it more interesting, more interesting, like keep the viewer interested. And then eventually something happens that, you know, really ties it all together and, and makes the story, you know, what it is. And then obviously after that, you can phase it out and kind of, you know, work towards your conclusion yeah, of your story. Like, get so, out. I, yeah. I think of it too, for, for you, for YouTube videos specifically, it's like when you get to that climax and you have that big moment, and it's like, I'm trying to get better at like just getting out of the video. It's like that moment, that big moments happened. Now get out. Like, cause yeah. people have seen it and they're like, all right, they, that's what they clicked on. Like, that's why they're watching all the way mm -hmm. to this point. So then get out as soon as possible. Um, while still, you know, closing out the story in a good yeah. part, but you don't need to like drown it out. No. You know, but I, I also see the story arc as like, you know, you, you're building up to this climax and you almost want these like little victories throughout the way. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like little victory, oh, more stress, little victory, more stress kind of thing. And that's, I feel like how you retain the audience. And it's something I'm, you know, we're both still working on. Yeah, for sure. And you're trying to, you know, still figure out like what works, what doesn't work. But the beauty of YouTube analytics is it just, it gives you that even if you don't like what they're telling you, that's just the cold, hard truth. Yeah. It's like people are dropping off at this moment because, of whatever reason. So just look at those little drops in your YouTube analytics and that's definitely helped me at least. Yeah. And, and like if there are any challenges in your story, film it like any sort of challenge that you can overcome and create and, and, and push through the challenge and, and resolve that. That's what makes a good story. Mm -hmm. You know, like anytime like you get a flat tire or you snap off a fish, like that build up, like, Oh, that stress, like you're saying, yep. is what gets resolved, and that's what kind of brings your story further. Is is those mini successes and those little victories? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't if if shit hits the fan, film it. Yep. Totally. <laughs> Always be rolling. Always have the camera on you. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think people don't realize with filming fly fishing is like it looks like we're on this just awesome trip. And it's just everything's good and everything's great and we're having a good time. Like we're having a good time. But there's also like, we're not just fishing the whole time. Like the camera's right there. 
like we got to sacrifice fishing time to film because you need to film mm-hmm. to like capture these these certain moments. So yeah, it's just a tough balance. Like yeah. the, the, people don't see that, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be interesting to do like a behind the scenes, you know, kind of of like of fly fishing, filming fly fishing videos, or yeah. just to kind of show the process that goes into that. Yeah, there, there, there definitely is a process to it. Yeah, that's for sure. Exactly. Yeah, I try and film some BTS stuff here and there, but. Some t- it just ends up in a folder and it'll eventually get used. So definitely, dude. Behind the scenes video coming soon. Coming soon, guys. Oh, okay, so this is a good one off of what we were just talking about. How do you protect your mirrorless cameras on the river? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, these things are expensive. You d- you really don't want to destroy your camera in the water, in the salt, in the sun. You know, there's a lot of things out there that'll get your camera. So I mean, the best thing that you can do. First of all, if you're in a boat, use a Pelican case mm-hmm. or some sort of waterproof or some sort of waterproof case. Yeah. You don't want to bring a backpack into a boat because sometimes boats get water in them. They'll soak through your backpack. You know, filming involves a lot of gear and not only your cameras get messed up, but your tripods, they all have moving parts, drones, all these things are vulnerable to the elements. So, I mean, what? waterproofing is, is you know you can't you can't just waterproof a camera and shoot with it all the time you know you don't want to have like this massive underwater housing that you're just shooting with like you're gonna have to hold your camera over the water to get mm. the shot like it's gonna be directly over the water in your hands and if you slip <laughs> and you drop that thing it's going down yeah and you just gotta Work on your grip. Maybe get one of those grip strengthening tools. Do some rock climbing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, and buy insurance. <laughs> and buy insurance. Yeah, but real talk, I mean, there's a lot of cameras out there that are weather sealed, and that's super important to consider when you're, when you're buying a camera. Is like, is it weather sealed? Are the lenses weather sealed? Because some lenses aren't weather sealed, and they have to be able to get a little bit of splash on them. Like, it'll, it'll happen. Like, yeah. it's going to drizzle rain while you're out there like fishing it's just gonna happen and you're gonna get little splashes on your camera so when you're when you're buying a camera definitely consider getting weatherproofed or weather sealed gear on top of that like having an underwater setup is is awesome um not everyone can afford one they're really freaking expensive just for a housing you can pay more than you would for a camera but if it is raining and and you are trying to get the shot um one thing you can do if you don't have an underwater housing available is just use like a trash bag and wrap a trash bag around your camera and use rubber bands or they make these things that actually go over your camera that are like meant for cameras. They're like these, they're basically trash bag material. I think they're clear, but they like fit around your lens, fit around your camera and you can like kind of stick your hand in there yeah, and, yeah, the buttons yeah. and operate. So, so like if it's raining or something, you can still use your camera. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you know, and that's when some of the coolest shots turn out is in the rain and in those harsh elements, like it goes back to what we were saying earlier, like documenting when the bad things are happening, like say a rainstorm, thunderstorm rolls through. You want to document that because that's a challenge that you're overcoming in your story of pursuing whatever species you're pursuing yeah so you have to battle the elements we're forced to do so it's the outdoors you know you don't have a choice sometimes yeah there's no clear story every time like there's no happy ending every time also so like sometimes videos is just like well we did what we could man and you know we just the fish just weren't there or like weather was shit like it just you know, it's out of our control. So that's another thing. Don't be so hard on yourself. Like when you're, when you're making a fishing video and there's, there's stuff that doesn't happen, how you planned it was going to happen. Cause that's just like, it's fishing. It's not going to happen yeah. how you plan it to. Yeah. Manage your expectations too. You know, you have to, you have, you have to be ready for things to shit, things to hit the fan, you know? Totally. Yep. It's, we'll have uh this last one the guy says, gotta know his go-to raft beer. Ooh, PBR PBR that's 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 my go-to everyday beer you know classic it's 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 light enough that you're not gonna wake up and have that uh little headache in the morning but heavy enough that you can sip it and enjoy it on warm or cold day so I don't know Pabst Blue Ribbon dude it's a classic (laughs) I love it yeah well I appreciate you guys all sending in questions um 
you know, we definitely want to do more of these kind of Q&A style, uh, you know, podcasts and, and just kind of dive into some of these these questions that you guys have. And appreciate Will for, for answering some of these. This has been great, especially just getting another perspective. Like I was telling you, I don't get to talk with many people who are like into filming, like face to face a lot. And so like when I do, we just, I just like nerd out and I'm just get <laughs> so excited because it's like we can like speak the, the same language in a way. And so I love, I just love that. Yeah. It's super fun, man. I, I love talking about filming and cameras and, you know, we spend so much time doing these things and a lot of it is spent, you know, like doing it. We're the only filmer a lot of the time, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's cool to be in the presence of other filmers, other people that have sim- similar passions and be able to talk about and mm-hmm. shoot the shit and share some of the stuff with you guys. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, of course, dude. Yeah. There's a shared experience too of filming and like putting the other video is, is really unique. And I know we're, we're, we've, we've got some stuff we're cooking up hopefully in the future that we'll be hopefully collaborating on some stuff here, here soon. I would love to, but two more questions before we close. Um, one, what, would you say is the biggest mistake that you made getting into this that you'd want to tell your younger self? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I make sometimes is worrying too much about gear or, or relying too much on the gear because, you know, there's times I'll go on a trip and I'll bring so much stuff and I don't use half of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I've filmed more and more, I make a point to use every piece of gear I bring at least once. You, like, if I bring my drone, like, I'm going to at least get a drone shot. Even if it's the shittiest drone shot ever, I'm going to fly it and use it just because otherwise it's completely pointless if I'd brought it to freaking Argentina and not even flown it once. You know, it's mm-hmm. a long way to go. But, again, like, gear th- is such a big topic in photography and filming like you see people like on team canon team sony like like oh this you have to have this camera or else this one's like not gonna work and like Mm -hmm. i'm filming with a red like your your sony is not good like all these things don't really matter like all cameras are good if you know how to use them they all are like you can't really buy a shitty camera these days if you learn how to use any camera, you can get shots that you want to if that you want to get, mm-hmm. and it, it really comes down to the to the Indian, not the arrow kind of deal, you know. Gotcha. So that's my best piece of advice: is don't get hung up on your gear. If you have an iPhone, shoot with your iPhone. You're gonna be able to make a cool video. Like I remember, there are these guys. I think it was Sherpa Cinema or Camp Four. They made an ad for Apple for an iPhone all shot on iPhone and you'd watch it and you wouldn't be able to tell. You'd think that they shot the whole thing on reds, but it was all shot on an iPhone. Yeah. So it's like when it comes down to it, don't worry too much about your gear. If you have the knowledge and you understand how to use a camera, then you will be able to get good shots. Mm -hmm. You know, there, if you put someone that's really at the top of their game in filmmaking with an iPhone and then someone who has never operated a camera in their life, with a red and they both go out filming which camera is going to get a better video it's probably going to be the guy that actually knows how to use camera with the iphone so i don't know that's just my two cents no that's good it's like again concept over production value like if if you understand how to use it and that's also with the iphone you can now change your settings like you can change you can film 4k in 24 frames a second or you can film in slow-mo you can film 30 frames a second you can film 60 frames a second and you they have like 240 like if you if you utilize all those settings that you already have on your phone you can mix it up already on your iphone you know yeah and so yeah it's just understanding that and going you know learning and uh learning as you go pretty much yeah exactly <laughs> i honestly think i just might sell all my cameras and start filming on an iphone only <laughs> dude an iphone only youtube channel let's go <laughs> yeah all right, so last question. What, for you, what, if you look into, like, the future, let's say, like, five, ten years down the road, like, what is next for you and what do you want to do uh, with the rest of your career or going forward with your career? I mean, moving forward, I want to expand into other areas of outdoors filming. Um, you know, like we were talking about earlier, I really, like, I love fly fishing, but out here in Montana, it's more of a seasonal thing. 
and I'm not, I haven't been traveling as much lately because of COVID and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I spent a lot more time filming skiing and snowboarding this winter. So moving forward, like it's cool to have kind of a seasonal gig, you know, focus more on skiing and snowboarding in the winter. And then in the summertime, focus more on fly fishing and mountain biking and, you know, keeping a well-rounded palette of sports to focus on really, it makes my fly fishing videos better because like we were saying earlier, taking the time off and then coming back to it with fresh eyes, instead of just filming the same thing over and over again, you just get in this rhythm and you don't even think about it and you're just getting the same shots over and over. But if you take a step back and do something different and then come back to fly fishing with a fresh set of eyes, I feel like it's almost even better than as if I'd spent the whole time just filming fishing, if that makes any yes, sense. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Totally dude. That's so, so good. I think it's huge advice. And, uh, yeah, dude, I, I really appreciate, you know, spending some time and chatting out about this stuff. I hope you guys who are listening, hopefully this, this will bring some value to you. If you're uh, trying to get into videography or photography or anything like that, find people who are in, have a similar interest as you and find people who are better than you and just learn from them and talk with them. And, um, yeah, no, I, I no, it's super fun. I really appreciate you coming on, dude. And uh, if you guys also, if you haven't already, go check out Will's YouTube channel. We'll link it below. What For people who want to find you on, on social media and want to check out your work, where should they find you? Um, you can find me on Insta, Felp, uh, at Phelps406. Um, I got a link to my website. You can check out some of the stuff that I don't really put on social media. You can see you know, more of my personal work and stuff that I'm working on currently. Um, and also, yeah, YouTube is a great place to see my most current per like videos that I'm making myself. You know, I do stuff with off the grid and I do a lot of other work and obviously I can't really post that stuff mm -hmm. to my YouTube channel. Um, but if you go on my website, I usually link all that stuff on there. So you can see some of the other work that I do outside of YouTube on my website. Yeah. So definitely yeah, feel free to, free to click around the links. So there's some film tour movies in there. Yeah. And just some really badass stuff. But sweet, dude. It's been a ton of fun. And uh, yeah, if you guys have made it this far, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like this video. It helps us out a ton. And it helps us know we're, we're doing the right thing. And yeah, let us know if you guys have any more questions about stuff that we can cover in a future episode. Or if you've, uh, you know, what you think about the episode. If, if this helped you at all, we, we would love to hear it. So... Again, appreciate you guys listening or watching, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Later. Later.